Hey fellow explorers, when people meet me in real life after having watched my YouTube videos, they often ask me as the first question, hey, are you, are you that YouTube guy? Uh, to which I say, yes, I'm that YouTube guy. I mean, which YouTube guy, but obviously the travel one, yes. The second question they usually ask is, can, can I, can I take a selfie with you? And then when we're taking the selfie or after we take the selfie, the third question they often ask is, Chris, do you do, you do this full time? Are you a full time YouTuber? Or they say it as a statement to say, Chris, I, I really wish I had your job to do what you do full time. And to which they're often surprised to find out that this isn't my full time job, that I'm also a software engineer to which the remark is often, Chris, how do you how do you do it? How do you run a YouTube channel? How are you a software engineer uh, and raising a young family all at the same time? And so that's what I'm gonna share today, how I juggle all these things and how if you're considering diving into YouTube or you've already dove in and you're well on the journey, um, you could probably learn some things from this as well. And if you're not looking to start a channel, then you might just learn a little bit about my life and how I'd like to juggle, I guess. Uh, and so in particular, I titled this stream, How to Be a YouTuber in Your Spare Time, because that's what all the commercials tell you, right? All the infomercials, like how you can become a real estate agent in your spare time, which typically implies you're doing something else with the majority of your time and then something on the side with a little bit of your spare time. And by the way, it's not just me. Many of your uh, probably favorite YouTubers out there also have jobs outside of YouTube. Uh, Mark Walters from Walters World, he is a professor at a university. Uh, Mark Rober, he uh, was an engineer working at Apple Computers until he had 10 million subscribers still working day to day at Apple Computers. Uh, and so it's totally possible to be a really successful YouTuber and a YouTube millionaire in that case in your spare time. All you have to do is follow my 20 step plan. And how much is that 20 step plan going to be? It's free in today's live stream. All right, great. So the first step I've got in this 20 step plan about how to be a successful YouTuber in your spare time is first to pick a subject that you're going to be passionate about over a long time. Something that I see people do a lot is they pick a topic that they're like, oh, this would be cool, or it would get a lot of views, and then they make five or 10 videos, and they've either run out of ideas for the content, or they're just tired about it. They're not passionate about it. And really, YouTube is a um, marathon as opposed to a sprint. Consistency over time is what leads to success for most people on this platform. Um, and, you know, so this is all, I mean, many of you may have discovered me within the last few years. I know there's many of you who've been here for a long time, but I've been uploading videos since 2008. I mean, that's a, that's a long time when I do the math. How many years is that? One, two, carry the five. I don't know. It's a lot of years. Um, but it's something where, uh, you know, a lot of YouTubers, people think, oh, they were successful overnight. But, you know, go take a look at some of their like about pages. And then you're like, oh, I saw this one channel. They took off in the span of just a couple months. Well, then you come to find out that that person actually had like 17 channels before that one. And they learned all those lessons to carry into this one. All right. So pick a topic that you can be passionate about over time. All right. Number two, the second step to be a successful YouTuber in your spare time is to pick a subject that you can record videos about that already happen to be things that you're already doing. Uh, if you have to do special things to make videos and you've already allocated a bunch of your time in the week to do something else, then you just have a lot less time to go do special things to make your videos. But if you just decide what you're gonna record or things you're already doing, then it doesn't take that much longer to make those videos. Now you just have to turn the camera on and record it. And so in the case of me, um, we like to travel and we travel a fair bit. And so making videos while we're traveling or making videos about travel, travel informational videos about, you know, Marriott rewards, about how to book cheap flights. Those are all things that are just like rattling around in my head anyway. Uh, and so they, didn't, they don't take a lot of extra effort other than maybe the time to sit down and record the video. 
Um, but if it's a vlog about a restaurant, I'm eating there anyway, and so it doesn't take that much longer to just go ahead and turn on the camera. Uh, I've also recently started up uh, the channel for our daughter, the Spunky Princess channel, if you haven't checked it out yet. And uh, in that channel, we're basically doing the kids' version of Blippi. If you have kids, you might have seen Blippi. If you haven't, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But Blippi, as an adult, maybe like the Pee Wee Herman of today, um, without the drama surrounding the Pee Wee Herman of old, uh, he makes YouTube videos where he goes to a ton of children's indoor playgrounds and basically plays in them and talks about what he sees and the colors. And so we're doing that with our daughter. We're taking her to a bunch of indoor playgrounds and we're like, you know, maybe people want to watch these videos, not with an adult in the indoor playground, but a kid in the indoor playground. And because we're already there, it's not much more work to create those videos. So think about the things that you already do that perhaps you can shoot that people would be interested in. And I think particularly in the space of travel content, some people might say, well, Chris, I don't live in an interesting destination. You know what, if you live in a small Swedish town, there's probably some people that might find that interesting. I recently stumbled on a YouTube channel about uh, this lady who lives in like, in Siberia, in like the coldest city on the planet. And her videos are just all about life in that in that city and she's gotten like millions of views which people might have said well nobody cares about this little town it turns out there's a bunch of people that are interested in that um and uh <clears throat> paint killer says i think for the best results by the way i'm doing this live for those of you on the live stream for those of you watching the archive these comments will come from people on the live stream uh person i think for best results you would need to somehow set yourself apart from others I definitely agree, and I don't think you necessarily want to just try to do the same thing that other people are doing, um, but you want to think about what value can you bring that other people aren't already doing. Um, and so that's how I like to think about ideas. But just because you might not have the idea for your channel all fleshed out and perfect, it's not to say that you can't change it as you go. You totally can. And in the 15 years I've been uploading videos to Yellow Productions, they've definitely ebbed and flowed and arced over I've found out what's worked, what I like to do, what I like to do better, what I have the time to do. I've created some more of different things and less of other things as the years uh, have gone on. Uh, and Brandon says uh, that uh, he and SoCal Seth have been watching for a long time too. I know that and I value every single one of you that has been with me for uh, five, ten years. Pretty, pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you for um, hanging on all these years. All right. The Third thing, third step to be a successful YouTuber in your spare time is to plan and outline videos before you shoot them. And so the mistake that I see a lot of people do is they just go someplace with their camera and then they just turn it on and they don't have a great idea of what they're going to record or what the story is and they end up shooting a bunch of video and then getting it home and then editing it and then realize there's there's no there there. There's like, there's not a story, there's not a video. They didn't capture something critical they needed. So then they have to go back to that destination again, or they have to rebuild the boat that they were making the video on because they didn't capture this step in it. And so, um, because you don't have a lot of time, if you're trying to do YouTube in your spare time, then you want to maximize um, the, the efficiency you have when you actually turn the camera on and shoot. And by maximize, I mean minimize the actual time it actually takes you to shoot the video, which includes um, not having to do retakes over days or go back places, but also includes minimizing um, retakes of the things you want to say. So like we all mess up, and so I might do five or 10 takes of an introduction, but before I turn the camera on, I've already got an idea about what I want to say for the introduction, what my 10 points of the travel guide are going to be. That's all stuff that I've um, like thought about before creating the video. And I, I didn't, it didn't start out that way for me. I was definitely in the category about like, I'm going to Singapore. Let me just shoot a bunch of video while we're there. And then I'll get back and try to make some videos on it. And now when I go, I'm like, I'm going to Singapore and I'm making five different videos. I'm making videos about cheap eats. I'm making a hotel review. I'm making things to know. I'm making mistakes people make when they go to Singapore. And then I record those videos. So when I come back, I've then got like five videos to, to edit. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, one uh, thing else to think about if you're doing things in destinations as you outline this is also to think about 
like what you want to say in a certain place. Like Hollywood often calls it like a shot list, you know, so there's like a scene in a place and then these people are gonna say or do these things in that scene. So you can think about um, producing or recording your videos in the same way. <clears throat> uh, and uh, G-Town asks, if I take the outline with me when I film? And the answer is yes. I typically have a paper copy in my back pocket uh, and an outline for me will be generally um, somewhere between one and four pages, but one and four pages, those are double-side pages, so it'll be on two pieces of paper um, for almost any one of my videos. I try to condense it down to that, because if I got more pieces of paper than that, it's just too much. And if I'm just doing a, a small or short video, then I use Google Docs. Actually, I use Google Docs um, to write all of my outlines, but I've always got them on my phone that I could just pull it up if I'm doing a shorter video, and now I don't have to um, have necessarily have a paper with me. And so that's actually my tip number four, is to use Google Docs or Apple Notes or something for your outlining that you can do on your computer and then you can also do on your phone because I find that some of the best ideas come to me about videos when I'm not just sitting at my desk. Like they come to me throughout the day when I'm at lunch or when I'm um, going for a walk or when I'm waiting in line at the grocery store or when I'm waiting for my food at In-N-Out Burger. I can just open up Google Google Docs and add a couple of more points to my outline. Great way to maximize time in your spare time is like, there's a bunch of spare time we all have that we're like waiting for things and we're idling. And so you can totally use that to work on ideas for your next video. Uh, Brandon says Google Docs saves on paper. Uh, indeed it does. Uh, Dave says, do the skills you developed in your day job make editing and tech work easier? I mean, I certainly think as a software engineer, it makes uh, like setting up all this computing infrastructure easier, like a lot of screens, a lot of monitors, a lot of computers and all the gear and all the stuff and how it all goes together. I'm sure it helps to have that uh, computer background, I would say. Um, but I think uh, there's plenty of people who do it without that background. Maybe they just have to lean on somebody to help them put it all together or buy a more turnkey computing solution. And, and those things are all um, out there too. Uh, and <laughs> Zachary says, 10 minutes to the first In-N-Out Burger mention. All right, so I did pretty good, right? Did pretty good. Uh, Justin asks if I've been using ChatGPT to help write content. I have not been using ChatGPT to help me write my scripts, though um, occasionally I use ChatGPT to help me write the description of the video. I'll say something like, if it's a video about the Santa Monica Pier, I might go in the chat GPT and say, tell me about the Santa Monica Pier uh, in 300 words. Uh, and then I kind of like be like, oh, that's what chat GPT says about it. Okay, what do I want to put in there? Um, and because it's, it's weird, like if you're trying to find out about Santa Monica Pier, the Santa Monica Pier website or usually place websites don't have like good paragraphs about themselves. You know, they got pictures and they got bullets and you're like, where do I just get some words to put in the description about it? Uh, all right. Uh, Carlos says, do I recommend using Office 95? Uh, you know what? I use Microsoft Office too back in the day, um, but I pretty much put everything to Google Maps. Where I still use Office is when I put the pictures up in my video. When I put, uh, when I put these things up right here, these pictures, uh, this is all done in um, PowerPoint. So that's where I still use Microsoft Office. Oh, I want that to, I want that to go away. Uh, all right, we're back here on number four. Oh, and by the way, Carlos, I'm still waiting for your message about Disney Cruises. You said you sent me a DM, but if you did, I didn't get it. So um, find in the description my email address. I really do want to talk about Disney Cruises. All right, the fourth, fifth, fifth tip I have for you to be a successful YouTuber in your spare time is to come up with the video title and the thumbnail concept before you go out and shoot the actual video. Uh, because, you know, a video can be great. You can spend hours on it and it's the perfect video, but if, if nobody clicks on it, then it's not really good on YouTube. And so on YouTube, the title and the thumbnail are often as important as the video and sometimes maybe even more important. And trying to shoot a whole bunch of video and then come back and be like, I wonder what I should make the title and I wonder what I should make the thumbnail look like. It can be a little bit of a recipe for disaster. Now, that being said, uh, you know, some, some thumbnails you might see me, like the one I did for this video, it's an expression, a red background, and 9.7 million views, how to be a YouTube millionaire. Um, 
you know, I have a set of expressions that I've taken that I can like Photoshop into various things. Uh, and so that's certainly another way you can do it. And when I've got some good expressions, you know, I might, I might reuse that expression in a few different ones. For these live streams, I like there's a bit more of the Photoshopping because I'm not in a place. For the actual travel guides that I do, I try to go take that picture. I'm like, if I'm in San Francisco, you know, I need to go down to the cable car and I need to go take the selfie with the cable car because that's gonna make or break this video, whether there's a good thumbnail, people seeing it saying, hey, I want to click into that. Uh, Jake asks if I think the channel name is important. I think the channel name is also certainly something people see when they see, um, you know, they see the thumbnail, they see the title, and they see the channel name. And so you can certainly position yourself with the channel name. You can certainly add some authority. I think my channel name probably hasn't done much to help me because <laughs> people look at Yellow Productions and they're like, what is that? Um, but at the same time for me, like it all kind of think works as a little branding thing with like yellow text and yellow shirts and yellow productions. And so when people see like yellow text on a travel thumbnail, they'll be like, oh, that's yellow production. So I do think it does help with uh, branding. Vancouver Dave says, uh, tips for making thumbnails pop. Uh, my tips for making thumbnails pop is to try not to use too many words. Uh, you know, three or four words like max on a thumbnail. I use Photoshop uh, primarily for my thumbnails, but I've also been using Luminar AI. Anything that I can use to save me time, I use. And so Luminar AI is a great tool to um, make pictures more vibrant without making them washed out. And so I drop my pictures into Luminar AI. I click the button that says uh, more volume, which just like pumps up the colors pumps up the saturation, makes my eyes look better. I can make my teeth look whiter if I want to. I don't I don't make myself look skinnier or anything like that. Uh, but I, one of the things I do a lot in Luminar AI in my thumbnails is replace the sky because it might have been a gray day when I shot that thumbnail. In Luminar AI, you can replace it with a blue sky and it'll relight the whole thumbnail. Um, and I've saved a lot of time using that tool on my thumbnail. So that's one I would uh, I would suggest you take a look at if you make thumbnails. Sunshine at Heart says your thumbnails are always funny. I appreciate it, Sunshine at Heart. Uh, I will say recently, we're gonna get into editing uh, in this and that. Recently, to make more videos, I've actually enlisted some help in editing some of my videos and also in making some of my thumbnails. Uh, and so some of the humor's with me uh, and some of the humor's uh, with my editor too. Um, but he's a pretty funny guy as well. I think we have a, I think we have kind of a similar sense of humor, which is why we work well together. Uh, all right, the sixth tip that I have for you is to use video equipment that's easy to use. You know, so many people, when they get started on YouTube, they're like, I gotta go out and I gotta buy the best gear. I gotta get the Sony A7S III and these fancy microphones. I gotta get this gigantic gimbal. And then it's like, it's all so hard and it's all so complicated that people don't know where the settings are, where the manual focus is, or how to set the ISO and the aperture. And then they spend all their time just farting around with knobs and wheels and not actually shooting any content. And so when you're getting started on this journey, the simpler the better, um, which is why uh, I I like to shoot with a cell phone. I, I just got this one, by the way, I'm holding this one up. This is the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, just came yesterday. Uh, but I've been using the previous generation, the S22 Ultra, to shoot a lot of my videos recently, like primarily cell phone, camera, that's it. I mean, with a microphone and a gimbal, um, but a pretty easy setup. And I, I have a Sony A7S III. Um, it's complicated. Like I got to spin a lot of wheels and knobs and I use that for special purposes. Like when I've been doing my like Christmas light walking tours and I need something that really works well in low lights, but honestly, that's not most of the videos I'm making and I don't need that most of the time. Um, so get something that you can grab and go always keep it charged. As soon as you come home, put that thing on the charger, charge the batteries so that if you have a spur of the moment, you want to go right now to shoot something, you can just pick it off a shelf and go. I always keep, um, not my cell phone, but all my cameras, they're on one shelf. And so I can just go and grab the things off the shelf, put it in my bag, uh, and I'm ready to go in five minutes from the time I'm inspired to shoot something. Uh, and the more complicated your setup is, the more likely you're going to be missing parts or not, not have a part. You've got like the transmitter for the microphone, but not the receiver for the microphone. Uh, and then the microphone like doesn't, doesn't work at all. 
John says, the first YouTube video I made, I put my iPhone on the dashboard of my truck and I recorded a nice fall day drive. That's a great way to do it, you know, and so, uh, I mean, if you have a cell phone, you have everything you need right now to get started making videos for YouTube, really. Um, and uh, Adam uh, says, his S23 Ultra showed up today. All right, sweet, sweet. Uh, and who's that girl says, I use Power Director for editing and I film with my S22 Ultra. Very cool. Uh, I use, I've made a video about my editing workflow, but just since we're talking about that, I generally use uh, Sony Vegas to edit my videos. I also use Adobe Premiere if I need to get into like some really power stuff. If I'm traveling, uh, then I use Final Cut Pro on my MacBook. So that's what I use to edit. I know if I'm making shorts, then I use uh, Descript because it does like auto captions and generation that can like just put those up on the screen and makes it uh, pretty easy too. Alyssa asks, uh, how do you ever, <clears throat> do I ever feel embarrassed filming in public? Yes and no. More so when I first got started, but less so now. I've realized now that if people are generally looking at me in public, it's because they actually are kind of admiring what I'm doing. They're like, what's that guy doing? And then, you know, once I stop recording, they're often like, is that for YouTube? And then, you know, it's this interesting conversation to be like, well, yeah, it's for YouTube. And they're like, oh, what's your channel name? Here's, here's the set of questions. I said, at the beginning of this video, I said, you know, it's three questions people ask me when they find out, like they see me and they know me, but what are the set of questions when people don't know me and they think it's for YouTube? So is that for YouTube? Yes. What's your channel name? Yes. How many subscribers do you have? That's always the third question, you know? And then when it's like about 300,000, then usually people's eyes are like, you know, oh, I just met somebody famous. And I like to say it's just internet fame. So it's not actually real fame. Uh, but then I hand them a sticker. So if you see me in real life and you want to get a sticker, uh, come up and say, hey, I've got these Yellow Productions crew stickers. I've been handing out to everybody who spots me in real life. It's the same, the same Yellow Productions crew that's on the front of the shirt, just in sticker form. All right, the seventh tip that I have for being successful as a YouTuber in your spare time is to set up a home studio. Uh, this was something I got as a tip from somebody back in the day, uh, five years ago, that said, you know, Chris, I know your travel, your channel's about travel, but wouldn't you be able to make more videos if not every video you had to travel for? Like you could make more videos in your home. And so then I went and said, okay, well, let me set up a home studio. And the thing about setting up a home studio is it's important to have it as ready to go as possible. If every time you have to spend an hour to set up your gear, cause you gotta put up your tripod and mount the camera on it and set up your lights. And uh, then that's an hour that takes away from your video. But let's say so you just send an hour to set up, you record for an hour and then you gotta like pack it all down for an hour. I mean, that's more time setting up and tearing down than it is to record the actual video where if you can just sit down and press record, you can sit down when you only have 15 minutes or you only have 30 minutes in between things when you're inspired to do it. Um, and I'm able to record a lot of my videos, like beginning to end. If it's to the video I did about um, global entry versus TSA pre-check versus clear, I did in this particular studio, I spent an hour or less recording to camera, a 15 minute video. I mean, takes, retakes, what am I gonna say? Um, but then after that hour, I was done. I didn't have to put anything away, I just, put the lens cap on the camera, turned it off and turned off the lights and folded in my monitor screens. I mean, pretty easy. So this has been uh, amazing, which is why I have two home studios. I have one up here and one downstairs just to give you guys varied uh, spaces to do it. The one downstairs is in a little bit more of our living area. And so there's a few more things that I like wheel out. Like I got everything on wheels. I got the desk on wheels and the lights on wheels. So that way I can like, when we're living, I can kind of put it into the corners. But then when I want to shoot something, I just roll all that stuff in. Um, my eighth tip for being uh, successful on YouTube is to record in batches. So by the time you've already sat down in front of the camera, you've put you've, your tire on, you've put your makeup on, you've gotten your tea that you wanna drink, why not record two or three videos instead of just one? I mean, particularly if you're going someplace. I mentioned uh, that when I go on trips, I like, I don't just make one video on Singapore, one video on Las Vegas. I'm like, what's five videos I can make on that place? Or what's 10 videos I can make on that place? And so in, in that mode, I will like batch write the outlines because before I go to Vegas, I got to write 10 outlines and then I'm in Vegas and I got to record 10 videos and then I come back and now I got 10 videos to edit. Um, <clears throat> but it makes it so that it's not every week. How do I 
write, record, edit, but it's more like, how do I spend this week on outlining things? And I spend next week on recording things, and then I spend the next week on editing things. Uh, I always like to have a number of weekly videos in my queue. So I think it, it, like now, if I just stop recording videos, I probably have like two months of content that I could put out on YouTube, which greatly reduces my stress level about anything I have to produce in a given week. And uh, well-rounded mom and a few others said, what are you drinking today? Great question. Today I am drinking a oolong tea from T, can you, can you see this? T, T, TPT, it's all across the cup, Taiwan Professional Tea, um, a new tea shop that opened up in Irvine from Taiwan. This one is not a milk tea. This one is a very strong tea. <laughs> this, is, this is like, mm. you can definitely taste <coughs> the tea and the oolong flavor in that. Um, yeah. And uh, some people are saying the eight is upside down. Yeah, the, the font that I'm using makes it look like it's upside down. Um, but Zachary says, no, it's not upside down. His belt is on too tight. But a boom, boom. Ch -ch -ch. All right. Uh, Points Traveler says, is there a country you feel the people are less receptive to being filmed? Uh, for, for sure. Um, and, you know, there, are, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I hate I hate to out specific countries, but there are definitely like places where um, yeah, people are like no filming, no filming in the store, no filming in the restaurant, you know. And it's like I don't, you know, what's like good publicity for you? I mean, I guess I will name one country in particular, which is Korea. When we were in Korea, we were making a, a, a one of my hotel reviews at the um, which hotel was it? The Rise R Y S E, the Rise Hotel, and I was sh with my camera shooting what's on the buffet breakfast. And I go sit down and eat. And at some point the manager comes over and is like, excuse me, sir, were you, were you videotaping? I'm like, yeah, I was shooting some of the food on the buffet line. Oh, we don't allow, we don't allow video recording in here. I'm like, of the food? And he's like, yes, please, uh, no, no recording uh, here in the breakfast buffet. I'm like, okay. You know, uh, and I guess rules like are there for a reason and I can assume in, I can only assume in Korea with the rise of K-pop and their dramas, maybe it's a fancy hotel and they don't want like if there's celebrities there, people like recording the celebrities or something. But like, boy, by the time you tell me not to record the watermelon on the breakfast buffet, that's like um, kind of gone out of control. I've recently been looking up, you know, what the uh, rules are about videography in airports. Something I haven't done yet that like, I thought might be cool. I do these walking tours. I'm in a lot of airports. I'm like, it might be cool to do the walking tours in airports. And around 9-11, there were a lot of restrictions about videography in airports, at least in the US. But it appears at this point that there isn't any. Like, in fact, you can videotape the security screening at TSA now, um, as long as your videotaping doesn't um, interrupt the screening. Interesting. Interesting how things change as we clamp down, then things open up again. But the place that you can't film apparently as a YouTuber today in the U.S. is national parks. Apparently that's like banned again unless you have a permit or you have an insurance policy, um, which is uh, like it, it like ebbs and flows back and forth. Uh, Nicole says, uh, how do you research about your trip before filming? Um, great. That's a that's probably a different video, which I'm going to keep that one as an idea about how I how we plan for our trips, uh, for the upcoming trip that we're taking to Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan. That's probably a really interesting topic that I could just walk you through, like what we did uh, for research on that trip. Uh, Chicken Marsala says uh, to your coworkers, no, you are a YouTuber. Uh, m m many, all, most, e even my boss knows I'm a YouTuber. My boss loves to watch my YouTube videos, in fact. So uh, yes, it is it's definitely not a secret. And I think, so like, there are people that I know that have been YouTubers and like tried to keep it a secret at work. And I think that's, that's a recipe for disaster. I think it's just open to be uh, like, it's important to be open and honest about it. Like this is what I do in my spare time, you know? Um, Raman Goda says, who films you? I film me a lot of the time and OC girl films me the other half of the time. I'd say it's about 50, 50, 50, 50. I'm running the camera. Uh, and 50% of the time, OC girl, my wife is running the camera and our daughter, she's only three right now. When she gets a little taller and can hold the camera a little bit steadier, she's going to be on that list too. 
All right, the ninth tip for being successful as a YouTuber in your spare time, we're just on recording outside, is to record only what you need. Now, what do I what do I mean by this? Well, you know, I've heard people say to me, uh, Chris, you can you can never have too much B roll. You can never record too much. There's A roll, and so in the you know film lingo, A roll is like the talking head shots, like the story shots, and then B roll is like the footage of you know camels walking around. They're like when I talk about camels, we insert the camels over here, so you you it describes a bit more uh, about the story or the A roll. So that's B roll. You can never record too much B roll. To which I say, you absolutely can. Uh, I I try to record just the shots that I need and not more because. Because if I've got um, 200 clips to edit, that's a lot easier than if I've got a thousand clips to edit. And I'm like, why did I even record this thing? Or where was that clip of the flamingos that I really wanted? And I can't find it because I'm sifting through other clips of dogs and elephants when I had no intention to talk or use dog and elephant clips in my video. Uh, so uh, I think the, the lens to have is to record with the edit in mind. like. As it's like plan it out, but then also think about how you're going to edit it so that then um, when you're editing it, it's much easier. And so like in my vlog videos where uh, it's not like a, it's not like a listicle, like it's not the instructional ones about things to know, but it's a video about here's what we did for 24 hours in San Francisco. In that case, that video, everything I record, I record it entirely linearly like the first clip you the first clip i record is the first clip in the video and the second clip i record is the second one and i don't say something as clip number 20 that then needs to go in spot number three because it just takes too long to edit it whereas if i can just take all the clips that i recorded put them on the timeline elevate the ones that are b-roll condense them all together delete the ones that aren't good it makes it much faster to um, edit one of those videos uh, my tip number 10 is to edit while it's fresh. The longer you wait from the time you shoot the video to the time you edit the video, the more time you have to spend getting your head back in what the heck did I shoot? How many takes did I do? What was good? What was bad? The video I referenced earlier about TSA PreCheck global entry clear that I said I spent an hour recording in this room. I spent an hour recording it and then I spent one hour editing it. And I edited it immediately after uh, recording the video. I had a couple hours of free time. And so I'm like, I need to record this video. I need to edit this video. I need to hit export. I need to upload it to YouTube in these two hours. That's what I got, time blocked. Uh, and at the end of two hours, that video was done. Um, and it's gone off to have hundreds of thousands of views which uh, is to say that, you know, sometimes um, tip number 11 is not to let perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, in the edit in particular, you can spend so much time tweaking little things, changing titles, changing the transition, changing the audio faders, putting on a different um, color filter, processing the audio, and in the end, it doesn't make the video all that much better. Like if it wasn't a good video idea to begin with, it all those things don't really help it. And I think for YouTube, um, you know, you, you all know that you're not here to like, I mean, this is not like good morning America. It's just, I don't, there's not a team behind me, right? There's me sitting in front of these computers. And so you might forgive a little bit of audio crackle here or there. You might forgive that I didn't powder my nose before this video. Those are all things that take time. Uh, and they're all things that really don't add, I think, to the YouTube experience. Uh, Meritocratic Mafia asks if I record videos for different platforms. Uh, generally I record the same video and then edit it differently for Facebook than how it's edited on YouTube. So if you watch the videos I have on the Yellow Productions channel on Facebook, they're the same topics, um, but they're edited differently with kind of like a faster pace and um, hard subtitles on them. And if I record for shorts, I'll rec I will generally record separate videos for shorts. Uh, I'm, I'm not great on shorts. I don't think I've like really cracked the nugget on shorts and I, and I don't do uh, TikTok. And so that's where Seth says, now that platforms have short form video, has your strategy workflow changed? Uh, uh, other than adding more things to record as shorts, not really, but um, I would say the new editing tool that I use with shorts is Descript, um, which I use to 
um, make the short form ones. When I do the short form ones, because I'm, I'm recording them tall, I record them on the phone, on the Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. So it has a little different workflow because now it's on the phone. To get it to my computer, I generally upload it from the phone to Google Drive. I download it from Google Drive. I put it into Descript. I put the titles on it. I edit it up in there and then upload it. And there's no thumbnail for the shorts. And so a um, little bit easier, I guess. Uh, Paint Killer says, I don't, I don't think shorts uh, work well for travel videos. I've not found them yet to work all that well. But the, like, the number one short that I did was a video where I was... Uh, it was actually one I clipped out of another video when I was in Redondo Beach eating a sea urchin, like a, like a you know live sea urchin that they crack open and you eat it. Anyway, it got like twenty thousand views or something. Um, so I'm st I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, and Raman says, what video do I record on shorts? I just go to the Yellow Productions thing, tap shorts, and you can see the I don't know thirty or forty so that I put up there. I've tried to do news. I've tried to do travel chips. Really, I haven't um, cracked the nugget. There. I feel like. Um, like dance videos or something like that would do really well on shorts and I don't, I don't dance. Uh, Points Traveler says, does the phone have five lenses? The phone has, um, so I'm gonna do a whole video about this phone, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, but it has four. It has a wide angle lens, which is like a 0.6 wide, a 1X, a 3X, a 10X. This one's a rangefinder. This one's the LED. And then it has the selfie camera at the front. So yes, there are five, five lenses on this phone. Chicken Marsala says, would you ever accept an offer to do a travel TV show? Why? Do you work for the travel channel? If so, let's talk. Um, I, it depends. I think it might be fun, you know, but it depends what the show is. All right. 12 is to edit backwards. Um, so yeah, this is like, this is one thing, I was watching a video about editing. There's like editing channels where people give tips about editing. And like, I don't know, this was one that kind of like blew my mind um, when I heard this a few years back. But it's like, hey, particularly if you do like a talking head video, like when I do global entry versus pre-check versus clear. It's talking about subject, I got an outline, beginning to end. And instead of dropping all that video onto the editing timeline and working from front to back, it's actually working from back to front because generally we record things with multiple takes like we messed up and then the third or the fourth take is the best one and so instead of starting and watching the first take that's not good and then watching the second take that's not good and watching the third take that's not good going backwards just finding the last good take and then trimming everything else off and not even watching it in the edit because it just wasn't good um, so there you go that's a editing pro tip tip number 13 is to uh, develop some repeatable editing processes, assets, and templates. And so like in the corner of a lot of my videos, you'll see there's like a little Topher that comes up and waves a thing and asks you to subscribe. That's like a, on Fiverr, I went and, you know, hired somebody to like make that little animation that I like, I drop into every video. Um, and like the titles that you see up on these videos, they're just, you know, I've already got the size of the letters, the color of the letters. It's the same. I don't do that every time. It's just a template that I use over and over again. And so those sort of things, it might take you a while to work on it the first time, but then you can just use it over and over again. And all those little things work together to ultimately make better looking videos. Um, the average Joe says, I really like the how. Is it to be a YouTuber stream? Awesome, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, if you've got another angle that you'd like to see me do this on, I'm happy to do that too. And Jeff's joined in the live stream too. Thank you very much. Blue Sky asks, how often do I renew my video equipment? Um, often, I would say. I mean, I would probably say every year I'm probably getting a couple of pieces of new video gear. So like last year, last year I got the, well, so I get the new Samsung phone every year because it's, it's in my pocket, I use it a lot. Last year I got the Insta 360, 360 camera. Uh, I got the GoPro Hero 10, is it, or something like that? Because I wanted to do some driving scenes from the rooftop of the car. Uh, I think those were the primary cameras I got last year. The year before, I got the DJI Osmo Pocket 2. I got a DJI Mavic Mini drone because I was going to see the Almond Blossoms. Uh, you know, three years ago, I got the A7S III. Uh, throughout this year, I've upgraded lenses on the A7S III. I've upgraded different gimbals. And so 
yeah, in any given year, I'm definitely um, getting new video equipment throughout the year. I think that is important. And it's like, I may be like contradicting myself when I said like, equipment doesn't matter, but quality doesn't matter. When like when you're first starting, it doesn't so much, but then I think there is a certain point where at least say like my goals with these live streams is to make them look like a, like a TV show, maybe a poorly produced TV show. But so when people like click the live stream link and they come in here, they're like, wow, this, it looks good. That picture looks crisp. The lighting looks nice. I, I can hear this guy. I will actually stay on this live stream because he seems like he has something he wants to talk about. I like to see the pictures of all those people in the comments too. I mean, I like to see them too, you know? Uh, all right. Tip number 14 is to, um, you know, if all this editing stuff that I talked about, really, you're like, Chris, I just don't have time to edit. Ha <laughs> ha, even better, don't edit. You don't have time, don't edit. Chris, what are you talking about? Don't you have to edit videos? Not if you do a live stream, this live stream, I don't edit. There's no editing once I'm done here. I spend the time to outline it, and then I spend the one hour here to record this, but as soon as I push end stream, I am done, and that's it. Uh, you know, and so like some of the days when I'm done, uh, I go pick up our daughter and we go have dinner, you know, like I got a time, I got a time, I got to go pick her up at this time. We got to go have dinner. So there we go. It's got to end at this time because otherwise she is hungry. Uh, and so like things end. Other things that I do on Yellow Productions that I don't edit are a lot of the walking tours that I do. That if it's a walking tour through the Santa Monica Pier or a walking tour through San Diego Comic Con, it's 30 minutes, an hour that I like record going through this place. And I do bring it into the editor to like process the sound and process the color, but I'm not like clipping it up. I'm not really spending more than 30 minutes on the edit in those videos. Mm. Yeah, Vancouver Dave says my closet must be full of old gear. I have a, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of old gear for sure. Uh, oh, and Geoman says, if you haven't yet, please do like the stream. It really helps me out. Uh, if you give it a like, it lets YouTube know you enjoy this video so YouTube can share it with others. So please do give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate it. And so would the Yellow Productions crew because every like of this video goes to feed them one piece of premium bamboo each so it's really it's really a good deal tip number 15 is not to obsess over your numbers or analytics particularly when you're first getting started there's so many people who put videos out on youtube and they're like chris only five people watched it or only 20 people watched it or only 100 people watched it i went to these other channels and so many other people watched theirs what am i doing wrong and in the beginning you're just learning and so there aren't a lot of views. And in the beginning, you're also developing an audience, so there aren't that many views. You know, on the Spunky Princess channel, uh, for the videos first getting started on that channel, I I was happy if they got 50 or 100 views. You know, that was more views than a Yellow Productions video got when I first got started. Um, and so uh, it's worthwhile to go in the analytics to learn what works, learn people, what people don't look, what people like, what people don't like. Uh, but I think like, you know, it's kind of like just like checking your, your 401k or your retirement account, like you don't really need to check it like seven times a day to see what the balance is because it doesn't change that much or it goes up and down. Like just check your retirement account once a month because if it fluctuates in the middle, it doesn't matter. That's kind of how the YouTube analytics are. And, uh, you know, people get like really torn up about losing subscribers. Every video I publish, I lose subscribers. Every single video I publish, I lose subscribers. With 300,000 subscribers, you know, video goes out to how many people they, they, they get that video pushed to them and they're like, I subscribe to this guy for Vegas videos. What is this video on Japan? Unsubscribe. Um, but in the end, more people subscribe than unsubscribe. And so uh, it's all good. But uh, if you see people unsubscribing from your videos, don't take that to heart. Like that video was uh, totally a turd. Wu Tai asks if I am on TikTok. Uh, I have, I'm not that cool. So yeah, I'm not on the, I'm not on the TikTok. Burton asks if I still lose subscribers after live streams. Uh, I lose more subscribers from live streams than anything else um, because live streams are like more heavily pushed to people and more heavily pushed to people that maybe um, haven't tuned into Yellow Productions for a while and YouTube kind of goes like, hey, there's this thing. And they're like, ah, I don't want to see these live streams. Um, but I don't, I don't know. 
is it is it not nice to say I don't care? I mean, like somebody who unsubscribes from the notification of one of my live streams is probably not a valuable subscriber in the L Productions family in that case, right? Because they they weren't watching my videos and like I don't want to watch any more of these guys' videos. Uh, there's one channel um, that's like a, a guy who's a, maybe like a I mean, he's a professional videographer. His channel's called Epic Light Media. And it's pretty funny, at the end of every one of his videos, he says, um, hey, if you're considering subscribing, please don't. You know, we're really trying to keep this like an exclusive club here. And we don't really, we don't really need any more subscribers. And there's this interesting thing about subscribers, about what's the value of a subscriber? And a value of a subscriber to a YouTuber is really only valuable if that's somebody that actually comes back to watch videos on the channel, not just for somebody who gave it a, a, a sympathy subscribe and then doesn't watch any of the videos when they're pushed to them. Because that actually hurts the channel in the long run. Because the way YouTube kind of like pushes out new videos on a channel is YouTube tests the new video with the channel's subscribers basically at first, right? So they get people who have subscribed, they've shown interest in this channel. We're going to send this new video out to a subset of them. And if they don't watch the video, then YouTube's like, well, I mean, if the subscribers aren't going to watch it, then probably nobody else is. And so if there's a bunch of people that are subscribers, but don't watch the videos, not really useful, which is why people ask, Chris, should I, I'm starting on my YouTube channel. Should I buy subscribers? No, don't buy subscribers. That's like, that's going to hurt your channel more than it's going to help your channel. Cause you're just going to have a bunch of these zombie accounts that never watch your videos. And John says, yes, a community is more important than subscriber number. I agree, John. And that's the reason why I do these live streams. I actually, I love to hang out with y'all. I love to see um, so many of you that come back each and every week. I love to see your comments. I love to see your questions. Uh, and uh, Emmett says, uh, Chris, you're one of the rare channels I never get tired of. Oh, thank you, Emmett. I appreciate the kind words. So speaking of uh, things to obsess over, not to obsess over, I say don't obsess over the analytics, but do obsess over comments. Um, I try to respond to every question that's left on my YouTube videos. Uh, maybe I don't get to every single comment. Um, I try to heart as many as I can. Um, but if somebody asks a question, like there's a question mark at the end of it, I try to answer it to the best of my ability, even if the answer is, uh, I don't know, but but thank you for the question. Um, and I, I think it's important for people to know that like there's actually a person back here. Sometimes I respond to comments that are like clearly hurtful comments. I'm like, you do know there's a person on the other end of these comments, right? Uh, anyway, that's probably like the subtext of that tip is like obsess over them in the sense to like respond to people who ask the question or respond to people who took the time to write a um, enthusiastic appreciative note but don't, don't feed the trolls. There are so many trolls uh, that in that case, it's a lot better just to ignore the trolls or delete their comments than it is to engage with it at all. So tip number 17 to be successful at YouTube in your spare time is to create more spare time. You know, this is one that uh, may sound like a cop-out answer and Chris, how do I create more spare time? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of things that a lot of us do that we find might take up a lot of our time and might not add a lot of value. And so, uh, you know, whether that's watching, uh, binge watching Netflix or whether that's, um, you know, just staring out your window cause you're tired or whatever. Uh, I think, and if you're tired, then you got to stare out the window. It's important to rest. I'm going to get to that as another number, but I think really looking at are there activities that aren't getting you towards your goal? If your goal is to be a successful YouTuber, you know, how do you get in there and spend your time on activities that actually get you to that goal? Uh, if you're watching a lot of K-pop music videos on YouTube, maybe replace those with videos that are in your niche because then you can like learn something from those videos. So I, I watch a bunch of travel videos, even if I might not be going to the place because I want to see what... Mark from Walter's World is doing, or I want to see what Karen and Nate are doing to see what's popular, to see what works, to see what does well, so I can replicate some of those things over here. And so maybe my forms of entertainment are also things that I'm like, help with my mind space of just trying to make um, Yellow Productions a better place. Uh, P.S. If ignore the trolls is one of my tips. I guess that was a, I guess ignore the trolls was a sub tip of obsessing over the comments. Yeah. So tip number 18. Uh, is in addition to like trying to create more spare time and like maximizing your efficiency, 
is, is to know your limit. I had a question recently, a comment yesterday that I said I would address the comment in this live stream when the question was, Chris, do you, do you ever get burnt out? Um, and to this point, after 15 years uploading to this platform, no, no, I don't. I've not gotten burnt out on YouTube. I also, I think I, I think I know my limit. I try to, uh, th there, there are days when I'll just be like, I'm, I'm not recording today. Like I'm not recording today. I'm not taking the camera, not taking it with me, not doing it. Cause I just, I recorded all day yesterday. I'm going to record all day tomorrow. So today's just a no record day. I need to, I just need to rest today. You know, I can't, can't always like go, go, go. Um, and like in today's, I don't know, especially in like all the like personal, um, like self-help channels on YouTube or the business channels. Like there's this whole thing about hustle culture. Like you got to hustle, 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 hustle all the time. And I think the hustle, hustle all the time does lead people to really feel burnt out because they're like, they're on a treadmill and they're like, when does this treadmill ever end? And I do like to, um, I do like to make videos. Like I've started up the other channel for the Spunky Princess. We do maybe a video a week, maybe every two. I don't know. Like there's there's no schedule to that channel. But when I'm someplace that's fun to record, I record it. I come back home that night. I edit it and upload it um, so that it just gets done. Otherwise, if I don't edit and upload it the same night, it sits on my hard drive and I never edit it and it never goes anywhere. And boy, there's like that's a waste of energy because then I recorded it and it never went anywhere. And so I always think everything, like if I intentionally recorded a video and I need to intentionally take the time to edit it. Um, but you know, on this note, like knowing your limit, like people go and say, hey, the, you know, Casey Neistat, he was a daily vlogger. Maybe daily vlogging's too much, especially if you got something to do. Um, even weekly might be too much, right? I think it is important to set some sort of goal and be like, hey, I'm gonna try to make a video a week. You know, South Park has a whole, documentary where South Park says like if they didn't have a goal of like a South Park episode was going to air on Comedy Central every Wednesday they'd spend all their time trying to perfect it and never get it out there and so um, there is a value to being like I'm gonna try to get a video out this week but I wouldn't like you know fall over your sword and you know work till six in the morning because you need to get a video out at seven the next day you know skip a day skip a week it's okay um because I think for the most part, as, as much as maybe we think like, oh, well, people are hanging out by bated breath at 8 a.m. on Thursday to wait for a video, um, you know, if it comes out on Friday, people understand. We all have lives. It's all good. People need to take some time off, too. It's all good. Uh, John asks if I think uh, having a day job and stable income helps you not obsess over making videos and metrics completely. Um, because and there's a lot of other YouTubers that have talked about this that have like, in my opinion, taken the plunge. I'm going to say too early into being a full-time YouTuber uh, is every video they make, right? The ad revenue on it is their income. And so every video they make, they have to think about, well, I need to make a video, not that I enjoy, but I need to make a video to pay the bills. So I need to make a video only about the topics that people watch, only about the topics that have the highest revenue, only people that are only going to click on it all that much. And Look, this video I'm making today, you know, is this going to be a, is this is this going to be another million view video on Yellow Productions? No, absolutely not. And I know that. If I wanted another million view video, I'd make another video about Vegas. Vegas is nowhere in this title. Maybe the more I say Vegas, the more that the YouTube AI will think it's about Vegas. Vegas, 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 Viva Las Vegas. We'll see if anybody comes in who's looking for a Vegas video now. Um, yeah, and so I think there is like a place of peace to to know that um It'll be okay. So I just like to make the videos that I like to make. Now that being said, because I'm I'm at this point in this channel where I I do take trips to make videos. Like specifically, I take a trip to make a video because I know everybody likes my what's new in Vegas every year, and so I go to Vegas to make that video. You know, I take a stop in San Francisco to make some San Francisco videos because I know people like those videos. And so in those cases, I do invest in those videos. Like I invest my time to make those videos. I invest my money to make those videos. Um, I invest in having those videos edited, some of these cases. Uh, and so in that case, there is some financial math about, well, they need to make this many views in order to make that investment money back. Um, but it's not the like guiding principle. My guiding principle is, is it going to be interesting? Am I going to have fun? Do I think people are going to watch it? Enough people, right? Like, and if, you know, and I go and say like, hey, if, you know, 
on Yellow Productions, if there's like 2,000 people that watch my one of my videos, that's a lot of people. Like if I think about, if I'm at like a conference, there's like 2,000 people in a room listening to me talk for an hour. That's a lot of people, you know? So um, that's that's how I look at it. <laughs> John says, the next video I should do should be how to be a Las Vegas YouTuber in your spare time. All right, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll pick that one. That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, Brooklyn Joe says, can you talk about the manor rooms at the circus or can I? I uh, I'm sure can. All right, tip number 19 uh, is to, and I guess this goes back to the money sort of thing, is to not get sucked into brand deals and sponsorships too early. You know, people are so eager to like make a dollar on the platform that when a company approaches them and says like, hey, I'll give you like five bucks if you review my um, cell phone charger. I got this recently, I got an email. Somebody's like, Chris, um, we will send you a $20 cell phone charger, you know, it's like a USB battery charger. $20 if you make a video review of it. <laughs> That's funny. And and not because that, like I'm insulted about $20, but I'm like, nobody's interested in that travel. So, like nobody, he, like you, well, you all wouldn't be interested in that. I'm not gonna waste my time to make a video on that. I'll do videos on interesting things and I don't need the $5 for it. You know, if it's an interesting piece of luggage or a suitcase or a backpack or something like that, then I'm like, hey, it all makes sense to put on here and make a video about it. But I'm like, the more time people, like all these things, they take time. You gotta like email them, you gotta have like a meeting, you gotta talk about it. And all that time is time taken away from actually making the videos and actually trying to get to what your end goal is, which is building an audience, people watching it. And you know, if you uh, watched my level eight luggage review the recent one I did of the aluminum case, you know, I'm like, hey, it might be fun. Like, I think, it, let me think about a different way about how to do a video review. I'm like, let's do it in the airport. Let's do it on the trip. Let's do it in the hotel. You know, it was like, like kind of try to turn it into like a review and a vlog all at the same time. Um, and so again, I like, I like to um, always have fun, which is going to be my last tip, uh, which is right after 20. Um, but I think it's also really important to keep learning. Uh, you know, none of us are ever perfect and this platform always changes and the capabilities when people like always change, people's attention spans change, the platforms they watch on change. And so I think it's always important to um, be plugged in to what works, doesn't work. Um, and like reading or consuming videos about like what works or how to be a YouTuber. Maybe that's why some of you are here that aren't even fans of Yellow Productions. You just typed in how to be a YouTuber and this popped up. And if that's you, if this is your first Yellow Productions video, you just typed in how to be a YouTuber and you made it here. I would love to hear that. I would love to hear that in the comments that you made it, you made it to the deep end of the video. Uh, all right, and my last tip for you, tip number 21 is to have fun. Uh, you know, I think at the point that it ceases to be fun is the point that um, it's gonna be really hard. Like if it's no longer fun, maybe you should stop doing it. Uh, if you have more fun at your day job than you do making YouTube videos, just maybe YouTube isn't for you. You know, there's some people that get stressed out about the camera and editing and it's all hard and it's all difficult. And, um, you know, so maybe there's another word I would use for, for fun, right? Uh, and I'll say, you know, like if you ask me like at the end of this live stream, like, Chris, did you have fun? I don't know if fun's the right word because like fun's what you have on a roller coaster, you have at a playground or in a ball pit or something. But am I like, am I um, thrilled? Am I satisfied that I had this great conversation, produced this video that people can watch later on YouTube? Um, did I learn new things from people in the chat? Was it cool hanging out with y'all? Like that was all totally cool. And so either at the point that it's no longer fun or the point that you're no longer just intrinsically satisfied about it, um, I think it's the point that you should stop. And that's really, that's really one of the things that kind of like keeps me going. And somebody said this earlier about like, I think you need to find what your unique thing is or what your unique value proposition is. You know, I published a Palm Springs video recently and I don't know, in three or four weeks, it's gone on to have 50,000 views. Not, you know, not 5 million, but um, like, I think it's the best travel guide on Palm Springs right now on YouTube. And I'm pretty satisfied about having the best travel guide on Palm Springs on YouTube. And I say that because the numbers reflect it, right? Like those numbers coming into that video are because all the other Palm Springs videos are mediocre right now. I apologize if any of you made a Palm Springs video, um, but those are kind of the kind of things I like to do. I like to find places or topics where I'm like nothing great exists in that area and how can I create something better than what's there. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. 
right, fellow explorers. Uh, if you had a question that I didn't answer before, go ahead and ask it again. You got a new question, go ahead and ask it. You're watching the archive. Ask a question because I told you I answered them. Uh, and the word people said they would use is enjoyable. I think enjoyable is right. Did you enjoy the live stream? I enjoy every live stream that I do, and that's a great word. Todd would put a second E, an enjoyable experience is what I'd call it. That's great too. Um, and, uh, Painkiller says, I should do one on Armenia. I find that many in the West are sleeping on this great destination. All right, I will keep that in mind, Painkiller. I've yet to go to Armenia, but I'll put it on the list of potential places. Points Traveler says, have you seen your YouTube revenue dramatically increase over the last year? Yes. Uh, in comparison to 2019 and 2020 that were like the, you know, the pandemic and, well, I guess 2020 and 21. 20, 2020 and 21, I mean, the bottom fell out on travel really um, and so now people are like back to travel the views are back subscribers are back so um it is it is definitely much uh much better now heather says how did you find your editor he found me he watched some of my videos and said uh hey chris i'm an editor would you like some help editing um videos and i and he lives in the same city that i do and it was like a match made in heaven so uh faustin says am i going to colorado soon um Maybe. I don't know. It's not one of our immediate trips, but uh, Colorado is a place we certainly like to go to. The Average Joe says, uh, did you ever speak to someone from YouTube about the algorithm that sounds like talking to somebody about the Matrix? I've not spoken to anyone at YouTube directly about the algorithm. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in like various YouTube uh, like creator studies where they ask for like feedback on different features of the platform. And so I guess I get a little bit of insight on like, what are they thinking or what could they share? Um, but like, I haven't really had to sit down about like, so tell me about the algorithm. How does this really work? You know, um, uh, Sunshine says, do you ever get lost on your trips? Rarely, rarely. The last time we were like super lost was probably 10 years ago in Japan. We were so lost. It was before Google Maps, all that stuff. We were wandering around. We couldn't find the train station. I mean, it was, we were literally, oh, Seagull and I are like, we don't, we have no idea where we are. No idea at all. Um, and we asked a, a passing by Japanese lady, you know, in our broken Japanese, like if she could um, tell us where the Eki is, the train station. And she uh, couldn't speak any English, but she um, basically like motioned and, you know, kind of like, follow me. And then she proceeded to walk 10 minutes in the opposite direction of where she was going to take us to the train station, which um, is just is a, is a memory I will always remember. Isaac says, what obscure YouTuber niche do you enjoy watching that we might not expect? Hmm. What's an obscure niche that I enjoy watching? You know, I like to joke about mukbangs a lot, which are like the Korean eating videos, although I don't um, watch them all that much. I do enjoy K-pop. That's not really an obscure niche. Uh, I guess I would have to like, you know, I have maybe like open up my YouTube main page and open up the, you know, library or something and look at that and be like, what's in here? that uh, library history, hmm. Um, I don't know, I guess when I get like pushed K-pop videos, no, here, here's a good one. There's like a whole set of people, and you might understand this one, there's like a whole set of people that make these videos about how to do creative B-roll or how to use gimbals. And maybe because I talked to you about um, like watching those videos. Those are, I sit there and watch people to be like, this is how you use a gimbal. This is the way you use a gimbal. Turn it upside down, do this, do that, use this motion, which maybe don't seem entertaining, but they're all things to be like, I I didn't go to film school. Uh, and so like those are, I'm, all, I'm like, those are techniques you would learn in film school about how to use a camera. So there we go. Uh, Raman Go says, what's your favorite hotel in the world? The Andaz Maui, my favorite hotel in the world. Who ties a sigh or black pink? Sigh, definitely sigh. The original Gangnam style is definitely where it's at. Uh, Rebecca says, your audio is always great. How much post-processing do you do on your audio? Good audio is the hardest part for me on this live streams. None, no post-processing on the audio. For actually all the ones I do in the studio, like if you see me do it here or in my downstairs studio, zero audio post-processing on those videos. Uh, and then a little bit on the, um, a little bit on the general travel guides that I do. The ones I do the most audio processing on are the walking tours that I do because I'm in really noisy places. And so in Adobe, that's why I use Adobe Premiere for those because Adobe Premiere has a lot of good plugins for like, 
um, noise removal and things like that. But I just have a set of filters that I've over the years kind of like refined. And I just, from my previous walking tour, I copy all the settings from that one and just paste it onto the next one. So it doesn't take me any time, but there is kind of like an audio pipeline that I put into Premiere to do that. Points Traveler says, you ever crash your drone? I probably have not flown it enough to um, crash it, <laughs> but, but no, not yet. Uh, Gene says, where in Japan you'll be visiting for cherry blossoms? Yes, uh, we are going to uh, Tokyo, of course. Then we're going down to the Izu Peninsula and the Fuji Five Lakes area. That's what we're doing on this trip. Uh, Greg says, what's your favorite local food spot in San Diego? Well, hey, because it just made it to the Yelp top 100 restaurants in the USA list. Mike's Red Taco in Kearney Mesa for their birria tacos. Super good, uh, super good tacos. Grant uh, says, uh, how long until you go to Japan? Uh, we should be there here around cherry blossom time. Pretty exciting. Uh, Paint Killer says San Diego is a nice place. San Diego is a nice place. And Wu Tai says, uh, yes, Gangnam Style is awesome. Sunshine says, have you ever had uh, GPS Google not working on your trip? For sure, I've had times where my phone died. You know, a uh, phone died, didn't work, didn't turn on, like had battery, but just didn't work. Like what happened to my phone? And it didn't work. So that's one of the reasons why I always carry paper maps. I always carry um, like a hotels if I'm in a foreign place, like the like take me to the hotel card in that language. I think those are important. Grant asks, I ever flown SAS Airlines, the Scandinavian Airlines? I sure have. I think they're decent. Um, not amazing, but I think they're decent. Geoman says, uh, will you be doing a SoCal meetup anytime soon? You know, I need to put that like back on my uh, list of things to do, but um, thank you for doing that. Raman Goated says, how long are you gonna be in Singapore? Uh, about five days for this trip. Wu Tai says, would you ever go to North Korea just to try it? I don't know, never say never, uh, but I, I, have, I have no plans to really. Uh, you know, it's like, um, I want to make sure I come back. So uh, that's one where I, I like to say that I've been to North Korea. Actually, I have been to North Korea. I've been to the demilitarized zone and I've been in that blue building that you can stand on the North Korea side where like they always have their meetings. So been there. I don't need to go there again, really. Um, all right, uh, other questions that I missed. Uh, any plans to go to India? <clears throat> no plans, but um, India is definitely on my list of places that I would love to go to. Um, Raman Goded says, uh, what about Dubai? I think Dubai um, would be pretty fun too. Yeah, for sure. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, with every live stream, I always give away a... Uh, Yellow Productions Crew shirt, and to win this Yellow Productions Crew shirt, this is how you're going to tell if you're a true fan, I'm going to ask you something about the Spunky Princess channel. Uh, and so my uh, question for you is, where did the Spunky Princess go in her most recent video on her channel? If you can answer that correctly, then you will win this <laughs> Yellow Productions Crew shirt shipped to you anywhere in the world. Of course, if you're watching the Spunky Princess and you want the Spunky Princess one, I will ship that to you too. Wow, that was, you know what? That was really fast. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. Congratulations to Kel L, the true Yellow Productions and Spunky Princess fan. That's right, the Spunky Princess most recently went to the San Diego Zoo. Uh, and that was one that I shot the video of her at the San Diego Zoo at the playground, same day, edited it that night, um, pushed it up at like 11 p.m. to get that one out there. Uh, and uh, Kathy was second place, Brandon third place. All right, very good, but Kel, you win. I think you know how to get a hold of me because this is your, we need to count up your winnings, right? I always love the repeat winners. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll send you the shirt that you want. If you didn't get a chance to win one, well, you can head over to the Yellow Production Shop link right there, also in the description to buy one. And if you wonder, Chris, when is the next live stream? At this point, it's probably going to be Tuesday of next week. 
But if you want to really know when, if I change or things like that, head over to update.yellow-productions.com, get on the mail list. You'll get an email as soon as I know when I'm going to go live on a certain week. Well, fellow explorers, it is always an enjoyable experience hanging out with all of y'all here. Thank you very much. Thanks for going into bonus time with me here today, too. A little more than an hour, but uh, it was great. All right. Well, as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video.